In previous videos, we've talked about feedback and phase relations in oscillator circuits. You might recall that one way to think about an oscillator is as an amplifier with circuit branches added to pick off some of the amplified signal and feed it back into the input. The phase of the output must be adjusted so that it is aligned with the input signal in order for the circuit to oscillate, and we also saw that there are conditions on the gain about the loop. In this video, we'll look at how a resonant LC circuit can be used to specify the frequency of an oscillator. We'll look at the basic physics of an LC circuit and illustrate how a common emitter transistor amplifier with the addition of an LC tank circuit becomes a Colpitts or Hartley oscillator depending on the specifics. Let's go! Let's begin by thinking about an LC circuit that has a capacitor and an inductor and has zero resistance. Suppose that the capacitor is fully charged at time zero, and let's imagine qualitatively how the charge flows through the circuit and how the voltage across the capacitor changes in time. We'll do this with a series of drawings where we depict the state of the circuit and then how the voltage across the capacitor here, denoted with a little e, and the current through the circuit, denoted by lowercase i, changes in time. So in Drawing A, we see that immediately when the switch is closed, charges begin to leave the capacitor, resulting in a current. The current initially is very small, and we see that the voltage across the capacitor begins to decrease. In Figure B, we see that this current changes in time, and that an EMF is also set up in the inductor as the magnetic field begins to build, as a result of the current flowing through the inductor. In drawing C, we see that when the charge is depleted from the capacitor, current continues to flow through the circuit. At this time, the magnetic field is at its maximum. This results in the situation depicted in drawing D, where a back EMF is formed in the inductor due to Lenz's law, and a current flows in a way to resist the decrease in current due to the depleted capacitor. This current continues to flow, as depicted in figure E, and charges the capacitor as charge flows through the circuit and onto the opposite side of the capacitor. When this is complete, we have the capacitor charged in the opposite sense as we began with, and we see that the voltage is now, instead of positive V0, is negative V0. So the current initially starts off, becomes a maximum when the capacitor is depleted, and then Lenz's law continues to flow until we get to zero and the capacitor is charged up in the opposite sense. Now at this point we have the same situation we started with, but as I said in the opposite sense in that the capacitor is charged to negative V0. And so the same process is going to unfold, but now in reverse. And so we'll see that at the end of this cycle we have V across the capacitor starting off at V0, the initial charge, reversing itself, and then recovering back up to the same value as before. And we see that the current starting off at uh, a small amount increasing, then decreasing due to Lenz's law, continuing on, and then increasing again as the field about the inductor changes. So at the end of one cycle, we have the capacitor charged up in exactly the same way, and we say that this has completed one full cycle of an oscillation. So as we said before, there is no resistance in this circuit, and L and C are both assumed to be perfect components. Thus, this process will continue on and on, ad infinitum, and we expect to see a sustained oscillation of charge sloshing back and forth between the capacitor, the inductor, the capacitor, the inductor, and so on and so forth, much like water waves in a tank. In fact, because the circuit stores charge, it's called a tank circuit. In reality, of course, there's resistance, and so the oscillations become damped and ultimately die away. But let's neglect that for a while longer. So this is the qualitative picture of the charge of flow in the circuit. We'd like to learn more about the process, for example, how the current changes in time, and how fast this cyclic process occurs, and we can do that by adding a bit of math. For example, if we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to this circuit, 
then we have an EMF in the inductor which is written as uh, negative L di dt and we have the voltage drop across the capacitor which is of course Q, the charge on the capacitor, divided by C. So when we write that down in the KVL circuit we lose a minus sign we have L di dt plus Q over C equals zero. Well differentiating that once with respect to time we can convert this Q term into a dQ dt which is really just the current I. And so we have a second order linear differential equation d squared i by dt squared plus 1 over LCI equals 0. And moreover, if we define a parameter omega naught squared to be 1 over LC, then we can simply rewrite that equation as d squared i by dt squared plus omega naught squared i equals 0. And this is a differential equation which is rather simple to uh, solve. When we do that, we get the current as a function of time is equal to some initial value times cosine of omega naught t, and there's a, an arbitrary phase in there as well. What does this tell us that we didn't get from simply sketching in the behavior of the current as we did above? Well, for one thing, this tells us that the current changes in a smooth and continuous way and functionally that is a sinusoidal oscillation and that it oscillates at a particular frequency the cyclic frequency F0 is equal to omega naught over 2 pi but writing omega naught as uh, 1 over the square root of LC we have the cyclic frequency being or the resonant frequency being 1 over 2 pi square root of LC in other words, a tank circuit has a single resonant frequency at which it oscillates. So before going on, I just want to point out a connection with history here. We just derived an expression for a circuit that oscillates at a single frequency. Imagine that we picked L and C so that we had a resonant frequency somewhere in the medium frequency or high frequency part of the RF spectrum. And we attached an antenna. Also suppose that we had a way of charging the capacitor fully in a rapid way. How might we do that? Well, one way that we could do that is we could have a bank of batteries like this that charged up a capacitor to a high voltage and then suppose we made that voltage so high that we could bridge a small gap with a spark. So suppose this capacitor charged up to such a voltage that it exceeded the breakdown voltage of air. Then, if we added a tank circuit like this, and we picked this L and C to give us a particular resonant frequency, if we could couple that then into an antenna, say like this, or maybe better than that, not like that, but we had a uh, coupling uh, transformer to an antenna. What would that do? Well, every time we hit a, the breakdown voltage of air across this spark gap, we would very, very rapidly charge this capacitor and we would have this oscillation of current back and forth in the tank circuit as we just showed with the equations. That would then couple into the antenna and radiate the resonant frequency of this. And that's a simple transmitter. In fact, this is a spark gap transmitter. This was the first technology that played a role in amateur radio, and in fact in, in all of radio. This is a lousy way to make a transmitter. <laughs> this uh, capacitor is charged up very, very rapidly because of the short duration of the spark. And so anytime you have an impulse like that, you have lots of different frequencies being dumped into this tank circuit because the Fourier transform of an impulse has many, many different frequency components. Moreover, real components actually have resistance, and so we know that's going to produce a damped oscillation, which, again, has different frequency components. So this antenna radiates a very, very broadband signal. 
and you know this technology was eventually outlawed in the 1920s. It it was it was uh, so dirty uh, from a spectral point of view. But getting back to our oscillator theory, if we write down kind of pictorially the loop that we described at the beginning of the video uh, of an oscillator, we have an amplifier and we pick a bit of the output of that amplifier off and we feed it through a branch of the circuit that acts as both a resonator and a phase shifter uh, depending on whether we need phase shifting uh, because of the character of the amplifier that we choose and then we feed a bit of that back into the input of the amplifier and when we do that this feedback produces a stable oscillation well we just talked about the simple LC tank circuit. And so you could imagine, and I've kind of put this in quotes because we're just making cartoons here, you could imagine the feedback element being a simple parallel LC uh, tank. And in fact that's really close to how it can be done in practice. There are a couple of common circuit topologies that incorporate this idea. And today we're going to consider in detail one called the Colpitts approach. And the Colpitts approach uses two capacitors in series instead of a single capacitor, as depicted in this notional drawing. The Colpitts series capacitors serve as both a voltage divider to feed a fraction of the output uh, back into the amplifier and also to do the phase shifting process. So let's consider a very simple or simplistic common emitter amplifier, transistor amplifier, and we've shown that here. So this is the, the usual thing where if you did not have this part of the circuit and weren't picking off any of the output, this would just be a simple amplifier. Usually you put a coupling capacitor in here where you'd have a signal going into the transistor and we have output coming out here. But here now we've added this bit of, you know, we've picked off the output and we've added this tank circuit. So here are the two series capacitors that we talked about just a moment ago. And notice that they're grounded here at the junction. And what this does is the, uh, these two capacitors together form a voltage divider. So we drop a lot of the output in the process of going through this first capacitor. And then the second capacitor here uh, feeds into, uh, couples into the amplifier. This topology also produces 180 degrees phase shift uh, because of this ground. This capacitor will charge up one way and then because this is grounded this capacitor will charge up in the opposite sense as well. Well it's not difficult to breadboard this sort of thing up um, and that's what we'll show in just a moment and I'll just point out now that uh, you have to write now because these are in series you have to write an effective capacitance which is of course just the product over the sum when you go through and you actually put in the measured value of these different elements we should expect to get a resonant frequency of somewhere around 370 kilohertz when you throw this together on the breadboard you get the following results the uh, the blue trace is the trace at the base of the transistor and so right so that's the trace right there and the yellow trace is what you get at the output of the oscillator now these scales here are different the blue trace uh, is one volt per division and the yellow trace is two volts per division so you can really see the pronounced effect of the amplifier. Uh, but you also notice that uh, this is a, a pretty clean sine wave. There's very little distortion. Now the frequency uh, read on the oscilloscope 
of this oscillation, the output, is 390 kilohertz, which is different from 370 kilohertz. And I suspect that's due to a lot of distributed capacitance and stray capacitance that you incur when you wire these sorts of circuits up on breadboards. Okay, well I just wanted to point out one additional thing here. We just did a circuit that looked like this. for the Culpitz circuit. But you could imagine uh, accomplishing a similar sort of result uh, in a different way. For example, you could imagine having a pair of inductors play an analogous role to the pair of capacitors. In that sort of way. So you have your, essentially your input and your output for insertion into the amplifier circuit. So this is a so-called Culpitz op oscillator. And this is a Hartley oscillator. All right, I hope you found this interesting. If so, please give it a thumbs up below. I'd love to hear any comments that you have as well. As always, thanks for watching.